Hello and welcome to the Kamla Show, where we bring you interviews and conversations with technologists, entrepreneurs, filmmakers, and other newsmakers from in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. My guest today is Academy Award winner Stephen Gagan. This is the fourth and final episode of our conversation with him that was recorded at the San Francisco International Film Festival. Here's a quick look at our previous episodes where he spoke about his love for books, why he became a writer, and how he came to write the screenplay for Traffic, for which he won an Academy Award, and the research that went behind in the making of Syriana. Books are great technology. Great technology. They've never, it's, it was a genius technology 400 years ago. It's still a great technology today. Incredibly portable. Actually feeds into a brilliant sort of um, spatial organization system known as the bookshelf, which um, really helps with your brain. Like you remember where things are. You remember where things are in the book. So you remember where the word is on the page. You remember where the page is in the book. You remember where the book is on the shelf, where the shelf is in your house. Um, all of that. Everybody in, in my family, I mean, my parents were like very worried, you know, they're very worried. Uh, put the air quotes with the fingers, our son, the writer, with air quotes. <clears throat> but I didn't care, you know, I didn't care. I had to do it. And then you ask why I write, and yeah, the reason you write is because you have to. Um, if, it's, if it's like a choice, you won't do it. There's yeah. so many other things you, one could be doing with one's time that are, you know, more obviously um, beneficial to the planet, you know. Mm-hmm. You can, and it was... Something else was going on for me, which was I was I was thinking a lot about uh, wealth, and I was wondering, I was wondering like if wealth was really created. You know, um, I was thinking about natural resources, and I was actually because I was looking at those Salvador uh, Sebastião Salgado photographs of Brazil mining. Mm. You know, where they dig the giant hole in the ground and they cut, they, you know, they go down in the ground and they find like a big pile of lucre. And then that that pile of money goes somewhere. And I was wondering if like if if maybe capitalism didn't work in almost like a perfect stasis that in other words, to make money, really what you're doing is you're either cutting down trees, digging up gold, sucking oil out of the ground, and it's just going somewhere else on the planet. So there's like a pile somewhere and a hole somewhere else, and there's a hole there and a pile somewhere else. And I thought, maybe the system is just sort of like this. The world is this tightly wound, sort of interwoven system. And I was, and I was kind of thinking about this in a real kind of neo-communist kind of way, if you will. And I was wondering what, what that was all about. Then 9-11 happened to get your planes out of the Holy Land. Then George Bush's reaction and policy, which seemed just utterly perplexing on me to me, you know, which was to, you know, it was a no-win situation to mobilize. You know, we had this big stick. You never want to use the big stick. That's the first thing of the big stick policy. Never use the big stick. But, you know, Bush missed that memo. Cheney missed that memo. Yeah. What I really was paying attention to was America's foreign policy changing radically, radically. Like the ship that's America had taken a hard turn. Someone up in the bow spun the wheel and the boat was just like going a different direction. You know, in terms of uh, nation building policies that we could go, you know, export our democracy and that that would be a really great idea and work. And and, they- and here is part four of our conversation with Stephen Gagan. Tell us about your visit to Beirut and which was kind of, uh, I've, I've seen the interview where you talk about it. And I think part of what happened is reflected in the movie when, when Clooney goes to yeah. see the Hezbollah leader. So I, I arrived by myself at the Beirut airport, and a man that I had gotten his, I'd gotten uh, a man that I'd heard the name of, I hadn't spoken to him, um, who was a friend of Bob's friend, David Ignatius. So David Ignatius and Bob knew each other a little bit. Ignatius, had, who I'd met in Paris, had given me some names, but I hadn't called any of them yet. And... Um, I, as I'm standing in line to cut, clear customs, I have an international cell phone that Warner Brothers has given me, and and it rings, and it's a it's a voice, a cultured English voice that says, "I, I have something very special you can do, but you have to do it right now, mm. and I can't tell you what it is." And I'm like, "What?" He's like, "I have something very special you can do, but you have to do it right now." I'm like, well, what is it? And he goes, my driver's out in front of the airport. Just get and go with my driver. I can't tell you what it is, but it's very special. <laughs> Who is this? And so I cleared customs, and there's a man there doesn't speak any English, and he's looking at me and gesticulating that I'm supposed to come with him. And I, you know, 
I have no idea. It was so stupid, you know. I, I mean, all rational thought. You should never go with this person. I mean, it makes it's the cultured voice that did you in. It is exactly. It's your damn English education system, you know. Um, but so I got in the car with this guy. And we're driving down this main highway, leaving the airport, and suddenly he just slows down and takes a hard right turn in this uh, four-wheel drive vehicle. We just drive off the highway down into this neighborhood. Um, and it was really weird. And suddenly we're driving through these streets, and I'm asking him where we're going, and he's speaking Arabic, and I'm speaking English, and just no one knows what's happening. And then suddenly we, you know, people have guns, everyone has guns, we're in a really heavily guarded part of the town, a gate comes down across the street, there's guys with guns on the other side getting out of a car, they're coming to my car, you know, your brain starts going in slow motion. I have my bag with me, and my little, you know, junior journalist notebook, and you know, all this crap, and suddenly they're like pulling me out of the car, they all have guns in their waistbands. And they're taking me across the gate. They're taking my bags. The one guy's speaking Arabic. And, you know, he's probably saying, it's okay. It's okay. Don't be scared. But, I mean, it sounds to me like they're going to cut your head off. They're going to cut your head off. And I am now in the back of this other car. And they pull a hood over my head. And, I mean, it was really, really scary. Like yeah, a, At that point, you must have thought, this is it. You know, I was thinking Daniel Pearl. I was thinking... Um, Actually, I had this thought in my head, like in Homer Simpson's voice, you know, literally in Homer Simpson's voice, this head is, this voice is going, you are the stupidest person that has ever existed. Why are you in Beirut? You're so dumb. You're not even Mr. Magoo. You're like, you're just dumb. You know, I can't, you're so scared. Your brain is just like, <sighs> anyway, and then, um. you know, it turned out these were all security precautions to go meet the leaders of Hezbollah. And, um. And, and they, his name was? they were very well. I was meeting, you know, there was the guy that runs the military section, and there's the Sayyid Fadlallah, who's the um, holy man, who's like the Ayatollah Khomeini or Khomeini. Away. Yeah, he passed away. Um, so I was meeting Fadlallah, who operates under a lot of security, and um, you know, there were a lot of a lot of different people there, but but it was mainly Fadlallah. Yeah. So there are a lot of personal incidents that kind of are reflected in the movie, like the time Matt Damon sits with his son saying, yeah, which is your son. Super personal, yeah. And then about the father saying, if you find me... That That's right, right back to my grandfather who used to carry a card in his wallet, you know, because um, he drank a lot. You know, he got sober towards the end of his life, but, you know, he died at 64. My dad died at 49. Um, I'm about to turn 49. You know, I just, I always think about it. Imagine carrying a card in your wallet that says, like, you're a grown man. You're a, you know, you were first in your class in high school. You speak, you translate Greek, you know, you have a formidable intellect. But you have a card in your wallet that says, if you find me, call my, you know, my son at this phone number, you know. And parents are quite mysterious to their children, I think. But my father ha had that call happen a lot, and he had to go find his dad. Uh, and I imagine that was not easy. I guess that federal judge coming up to you and telling you about your grandfather cleared up your perception. It was interesting, you know, and, and uh, I had the um, yearbook from their class, you know, and, uh, and my grandfather was um, a talented, you know, was really a talented student and a really smart guy. But, you know, you, 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 you can't be a drunk and function at, like, your highest potential. Just... Uh, doesn't work. But in the history, you know, obviously hard drinking journalists, it was just a thing people did. You know, he ended up a nightclub, like a nightclub critic or, a, you know, wrote a social column and, you know, reviewed plays. You know, I have some of his plays, you know, that he wrote trying to be a playwright. Which you, which you tried to plagiarize. <laughs> which I tried to plagiarize for my one creative writing class unsuccessfully. Um, it just was so bad. I couldn't like ultimately. The play was bad? Yeah, the play was terrible. Um, you know, uh, I'm lucky. I'm really lucky. I have a couple of questions from viewers. One question is, how did you accomplish the in-depth development of such a wide range of socially disparate characters? There are almost seven to eight of them. Did they come from Bob Bear's research or from your research? It, you know, it's 100% original research. You know, ultimately, Siriana was considered, like by the Academy, like an original screenplay. I didn't care at all. I mean, it's it's it's... It's not based on Bob's book, you know, in any way. Bob's book was about trying to figure out who did the Beirut bombing from 84, and he realized Iran did it. And my movie's about something else. Um, but my movie's entirely informed by Bob's perspective about everything, everything. Like, the movie is Bob. It's the tone of Bob. But I met other people who were amazing. You know, I have a good friend, Tim Goodale, in London, who's a finance guy, and he introduced me to a lot of oil traders in London. So the whole Matt Damon storyline came from these incredibly cynical oil traders that I was hanging out with in London. And
Where did you get the South Asian line, the Pakistani? That I made up, you know, and it came from a couple of things. It came from, it came from two places. It came from a Thomas Friedman article about cotton tariffs, mm. cotton tariffs, that like America subsidizes cotton from our government, dumps the free cotton paid for by our ta taxpayers on the world market, which collapses the Pakistani market for cotton, which puts people out of work in Pakistan. They leave, drift down to Islamabad, and they get sucked into these terrible things. And I thought, that's a great story. Okay? Yeah, there was a 10% quota system. Yes, and so that's a great story. And then I read something in the uh, Gulf Times. Um, I read this incredibly moving firsthand account of a, uh, a man whose son blew himself up. And he told this story in the article, and I was just I was just there researching. I was like in Dubai and Oman or whatever. And he told this story about how his son came to borrow bus fare. That the last time he saw his son alive, his son asked for thirty five cents, and he said, "A child, a child borrows thirty five cents. No adult, nobody who should be making these decisions as a, as an adult borrows thirty five cents. You just don't have to." Children borrow 35 cents. And it was so heartbreaking that, that I wrote, you know, that's that scene in the movie. And, it just and the cricket I'm sensing is from your trips to India. Trips to India and also from, um, you know, visiting worker camps in the Gulf. Where did you and, go to Dubai? Yeah, yeah. And there are worker camps all over the well, place. It's outside of Dubai. Yeah, outside Dubai. And, and you see these buses come in. When I saw the Tata bus. I know, right? Yeah. And, and so they play cricket, you know, when they have free time. And so I just, I loved it. And, you know, and this will be the last thing, but I'll just say that, like, you know, like, what's the effect of a movie, a political movie? You know, does it have any effect at all? I'm not sure, you know. I'm sure you have some No, some idea. but, well, I wonder, would my time be better spent just trying to help people directly? You know, I, I think, oh, I can do, do a movie like this and it'll affect the world somehow, but I'm not 100% sure it does. But something I know that our movie did that was a really good thing, and, I, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's quantifiable, um, is that, when I first went to Dubai, the worker housing mm. were shanty towns. They were shanty towns made of plywood. Incredible heat, these little wooden boxes packed with 10, 15 people, really abominable conditions. There'd been fires, there'd been, you know, whatever. Very dangerous. I guess word got back to Sheikh Mohammed that we were going to shoot in one of these plywood camps. And they were incredible. You know, the visually, they were so beautiful. I was like, I'm going to make, I can't wait to put a camera here. So we're, and he, you know, this is the thing about having a king. He just, he said, oh, that could be an embarrassment to our country. And overnight, overnight, one night, 24 hours, raised all the shanty towns, put up new towns of entirely air-conditioned trailers with good water systems. Is that what we see there? That's what's there now. And it happened overnight. Every single camp gone, every single camp, a brand new trailer, and everybody in them, 24 hours. Is that where you ended up uh, ended observing, up shooting? shooting? Yeah, and then in the, you know, I was bummed that my picturesque shanty town was gone, but I was happy for the workers that they got better housing. And, I, and then that was a direct result of a big Western film company coming there to, you know, dramatize it. Two last question again from viewers. Did you anticipate Arab Spring? And did you see it failing? Because um, you're ahead of the curve. Well, I did. Um, I guess I did on some level think that a quote Arab Spring. I think that we're in the middle of the Arab Spring. I don't think it's failed. I just think it's early days. I think it's all going to change for the better ultimately. Um, but I don't think repressive regimes uh, and oligarchies and monarchies go easily. I think they take time to transition, generally speaking, and then they happen. It's like generally, it's like it's like gradually and then all at once. And I, so I think we're in the gradual phase. But um, you know, I think the truth of it is then is that when the man in Beirut, um, blank on his name, was assassinated, when the car bomb. Mm. Um, I got to know his son pretty well, but the, the, uh, and the thousands of people poured into the streets, you know, and uh, I, I think that sentiment is the real sentiment, you know, and then there's a reaction to it. But that sentiment, I mean, historically, it's been very hard to eradicate it once it's going, you know. You can drive it into the shadows for a short period of time, but I think things move ineluctably, uh, 
ineluctably toward freedoms. You know, I think I think people move towards personal mm -hmm. freedoms. Um, I could be wrong. I'm talking over centuries rather than decades, even. But uh, I think we're in the middle of that. So I, I'm not ready to call the Arab Spring a fail uh, attempt. Yeah, I think it's the first one of the first attempts. But I I, I hope that it. Um, you know, this many we're talking about many countries, um, most of which were created in the last fifty years. <laughs> so after the British yeah, withdrew, after the British withdrew. So I think it's uh, early days in the story. Um, like we're in the, it's like the beginning of like the second act or something. So uh, be interesting to see what happens. <laughs>